Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And so in a way, as we're helped by God, our egos are not exalted, and they're not crushed in the opposite of being exalted. We're not demeaned and put down, and we're not saying, oh, you're wonderful and cute, and you're just fine. It's something else that happens, that we're, we, meet, um, we meet a mature person. We meet somebody who looks right at us and sees who we are and says, and this, of course, the message is given from God through people we meet in the program. And the people look at us, and we're in dread of being put down and looked down on and despised. And we're just hoping that people will think we're cute and wonderful and just fine. And they don't do either one. They look at us and say, oh, you're such a mess. Uh, we're really glad you came to this meeting. Uh, Keep coming, and they give you a hug, and have total acceptance and affirmation, and say, you know, you, whatever you do, please come back to this meeting, uh, because you know you're a danger to the community uh, in the way you are. Um, and so we get this different thing, you know. We weren't even looking for that favor of being accepted uncritically and unconditionally. While with eyes open about our, our suffering and our character defects. It didn't even occur to us that that's the way, because we've been living in fear. And when we live in fear, that there's no place for that. You see, well, we have to come to a place, fear, to live in fear is to live with the conviction that God or somebody or they are waiting to judge you, are waiting to evaluate you, and then reject you insofar as they find things wrong with you. And the, the, the revelation of a higher power, the revelation of God comes by the discovery that nobody's after us to judge us. It's just, they're just not there. Uh, what's after us is, um, well, it's, maybe why say the judge is after us? We're judged. You know, we're judged with love. Uh, what we dread is a rejecting judgment. And what we meet is that mature love of God that is reflected in people who are mature. The people who are, who grow up with a measure of faith and, and are kind of seasoned in treating people well and learning how to love well, those people have that characteristic, the characteristic of a good sponsor. In fact, my, my image of a higher power more and more is that of the like the ultimate sponsor, but the any a regular old sponsor will have two characteristics in the way they treat you that are in seeming contradiction. The whole program has a way of treating you that has two characteristics that are in seeming contradiction that I've already mentioned, and I'll mention them again. One is that they accept you unconditionally. You just doesn't matter what your record is. Doesn't matter whether you're, you're clinging to a bunch of nonsense right now, uh, and you're you're uh, you know you just feel pretty unhappy and negative about the way you have haven't solved a lot of your problems and the way people are bad to you are, and you don't see much prospect of it changing in your way either. So what is everybody so happy about around here? Um, and you have a sponsor who would, who would say, oh my dear, you know, come in. You know, don't go away, please. And, uh, you almost, and sometimes you, when you break through and finally confide in your sponsor and say a few things that you just were dreading anyone would ever find out. And then when your sponsor just nonchalantly says, uh huh, yeah. Yeah, I do that a lot myself. Um, and you almost want to make stuff up to test them. Uh, uh, 
and the there's that quality. Then there is the quality of them not letting you get away with a thing. I mean, how can they have all of this tolerance and acceptance and then just be nail you on the smallest thing? I mean, you just begin to explain why you're having such a rough day because you have a boss that's truly malicious and incompetent. Um, and that's why life is miserable. And you're, but instead of saying, oh, I understand, it's really rough, they'll say, well, you know, resentment's our number one offender, uh, and it can get you drunk if you cling to resentments against people. And self-pity dies hard. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, it's an inside job, remember? Yeah. It's all this stuff that just puts it right back on us. Uh, and then they're, they're smiling and loving to you as they nail you. And, you know, <laughs> Uh, and of course that, that kind of loving judgment is something that can be hard to take, but it's very bracing. It, it is so totally different than the, than the rejecting judgment of fear. Um, now the whole, the program as a whole begins to treat us that way. Um, it changes, the program as a whole has a way of treating us like a higher power treats us. Like it just will we'll not accept our agenda. We come in here with an agenda. They say, we'd like you to drop your whole agenda, please. And sit down and shut up and listen. You know? You, know, you attract a lot of people this way, huh? Yeah. Um, and they, that's why the second step comes after the first. Somehow our agenda has to be really destroyed or, or wounded badly. Like, we don't have much bright ideas left. Um, and the this is a characteristic of um, uh, of beginning to find this relationship to a higher power. Um, and that is that again, there's just Paradoxes all over the place here. But one of the paradoxes of coming to faith is that we are, we're surprised, we're drawn in to receiving some help that we kind of question in a way because it isn't what we had in mind. And on the other hand, it's helping us more than the help would have helped that we had in mind. And, well, it's good and it's really neat, but, uh, and we're, and we're challenged to start trusting that, see? To say, if you want more of this, I'd like you to sign your name. And sign your name to the second step. Came to believe that a power greater than your, our, yourself is restoring us to sanity. It's saying, will you agree you're being restored to health? Will you agree there's a new help coming in your life? It's ahead of you. That's, uh, surprising you, that you can't control yeah, in many ways, but you find out that you get more in touch with it, You, you it touches you more, the more you're willing to face the direction of the steps in the program where it started. You know? you, the second step says, we'd like you to face the direction of where the help's coming from. We tend to rely on alcoholic. I drank. I, I I drank idolatrously. I'm an alcoholic. When I drink, I ask alcohol to take care of me the way only a higher power can take care of me. I ask it to do it for me. Don't ask it to make me happy. I ask it to take care of me during this hour when I'm high. I and in so far as I'm have a belief in control, I ask my powers of manipulation to take care of me. My my power to to weasel and evoke sympathy and scare you and convince you and be quicker than I rely on my powers of persuasion to change you enough so that you'll be good enough to me so that I can make it through the day. 
I'll rely on that. And the 12 steps say, we'd like you to rely on a power of love and wisdom that manifests itself when you work the steps and live in the fellowship. It isn't that you don't think anymore or persuade or, or do, you can try to persuade people, fine. Then turn over results. You know? uh, but you don't count on, you don't count on getting the results. Whenever we are dealing with, whenever we're using idols, using money or alcohol or sex or persuasion, when we start counting on those things, relying on those things so that we can make it, we always have the results in mind. It's always result or heat on results. I'm relying on this so that I get the result, so that I'll get high enough so that I'm immune from you getting me. Uh, I want the result. And in this thing of faith, it says we'd like you to uh, we'd like you to come forward and enter into this way of life where we uh, start treasuring the kind of relationship we're given, a relationship that that's based on mutual respect and honesty about what's wrong with us, and learning how to tell the truth and rely on that way of life primarily. And then even give up the results. <laughs> and then you'll get results that are a lot better ever by miles than when you wouldn't give up the results. Uh, and here I, I wanted to make, I'm getting off with a point that's almost escaping me here, and that is it's strange. But as we give ourselves in faith and say, okay, I'll buy into this, I'm going to sign this. I believe that a power greater than myself is restoring me to sanity. As we give ourselves over to a relationship to a higher power, to the universe, that's different than this working it out in private that we've been doing for so many years, it seems like you would give yourself away and somehow your own dignity as an independent person would suffer. And it's just the opposite thing. How that we do not turn ourselves into a Jim Jones kind of thing. We don't turn ourselves in and abdicate responsibility for our lives. Faith doesn't work that way. We are walking the path of faith, and what happens is it wakes us up more, and we become more alert to what in the heck's really going on around us. And we notice people easier. And we start getting a little better judgment about what it is we do that hurts and what it is we do that helps. Uh, and we actually become more independent and responsible. And it's up to us to make our decisions and what we do next. And, uh, it's a strange thing, isn't it? You'd think you'd be more responsible when you're just off by yourself alone and you're by golly, I'm doing it. I'm taking care of myself. Um, and what we're in is in, in, in a secret weirdo relationship with a weirdo relationship with alcohol or, or pills that I have this pack that I have to get enough for you to take care of me and I have to be sure no one knows about this because it was harder to get the stuff when they know. Um, and then my relationship with everyone else is really screwed up. Uh, and that relationship to a power greater than ourselves in the tradition of the 12 steps actually brings us out into the community and turns the lights on. And our relationships are much more simple and honest with everybody. And we have a chance to be responsible and independent and not abdicate. Our, it's really, I mean, I can't explain that. I can kind of describe it a little bit. And as it happens to you, you kind of know. Now, kind of a theme here and the point of the second step, that as, if you're rejoicing right now and kind of a fresh faith in your life and 
and, and what I say, just kind of identify a little bit. You say, yeah, right on. Uh, or if you're, if this is a real tough thing for you, you just, <clears throat> they bring up faith in God, it kind of grinds you a bit. And, uh, because you want, it's so bad. And yet it doesn't seem to be working. Um, one point, uh, of a theme point I want, that I've been trying to make is that we don't figure out a faith. We, we let the experiences that some higher power gives us, draws us into as we begin recovery. We need to be taught by our own experiences. And if you identified with much of what I said at all about being drawn into the program and then being given some help that you weren't even interested in and not given the help you wanted, and another characteristic of God's help is that it always puts you in better shape to relate to other human beings. When you're helped by God, you're a better person to be around. You may not look any better. You may be much more aware of your own goofiness. But you're, you're better to other people. You're better at it. Of being, uh, you're better at loving. You know? And usually when we're hurting real bad, we're not asking, higher power, please make me a little more kind and loving. So I can, that way, I'll probably, people don't pray that way when we're in the middle of our disease. Please make them nicer to me and get them off my back and let me not be so sick. Uh, so we have these, in other words, look to the experience. We have a wealth of spiritual awakening going on. Look to the, and, and when you listen to other people and their stories, listen especially for the way they've been touched in a new faith. Because if you listen hard for that, you will hear your own experience. We have things happen to us that we don't have words for. And the experience kind of sits there in coates, you know, not understood and not described. And it kind of takes us identifying with other people for this to kind of come alive and start being more of, take up more room within us. Um, my time has been up for a few minutes. So I stop. Turn this off. This is the end of session two, the start of session three. I invite everyone to mosey toward a seat and uh, find your little, find your niche. Oh, the table's in here already. Oh, drying off, yeah. Uh, oh, you got to warm up with a announcements a little bit. Remind you that those who sign up, talk one-on-one, -on -one, it's right over there at the chapel, and the door is at this end of the chapel, kind of in the back of the nearest door you can find, the right. Um, part of the thing, it's after this session and we have our next sharing meeting that you have the longest break. It's, uh, you have several hours there. Two hours? Well, two and a half. Um, and uh, I want to encourage you to you know, make the most of your alone time. And the, sometimes we have to plan a little bit and make a decision to uh, see to it that we're alone for at least an hour so you can have that way of being for a while. And Sometimes you know, I don't, when I find myself in similar circumstances, I'll just kind of drift into one conversation after another and it's all over and I'm tired. Um, so if you... Plan a little time to rest up. Go to sleep or hide out. Go for a walk. Uh, whatever you want to do. Whatever seems good to you, you just think ahead. The other thing is that I will, um, I plan to celebrate Mass in this room at five o'clock. And I, we brought the table, the table that will be the altar in to dry out, kind of waterlogged, and uh, get a little cloth over it. And uh, at Mass, it's, it's an optional thing for a retreat. This is a, you know, an uh, interdenominational, non-denominational retreat. And so, uh, but Mass is a Roman Catholic Christian thing. So, if you want to attend, everyone's invited to attend that. There's 
Well, I mean, invited if you're uncomfortable with the whole notion, uh, then don't go to it. Be comfortable someplace. Uh, but just um, a couple of aspects of it. I just want to mention that it's going to be, um, it is important that we have a little kind of a sacred space for it. So if you're going to not a, be at it, I would ask you not to kind of hang around the other places, you know, where it would be harder to, for noise and stuff like that. Um, and some people ask about uh, receiving Holy Communion, if that's appropriate, you know, for, well, in principle, everyone in the world is invited to receive communion, because it's, um, it's only appropriate to say that the me- part, part of the meaning of receiving communion is that that's your faith, that you believe in Jesus Christ and you, and that part of the expression of that faith is this, uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Mass, and that, uh, and it's a way of joining up with the sacrament of initiation. So, if, so if you're a visitor and you're kind of thinking, look this over, well then it would not be appropriate to receive because it's, it's a sign you're joining up the community and you're part of that community. Um, but you're very welcome to, uh, absolutely be here. You're welcome to receive communion. You're going to step forward and uh, maybe, but if you're not ready to kind of be part of it today, then it would be later. You'd do that. Um, uh, people uh, ask, you know, in other religions, is that there's no official intercommunion between Christian religions yet. They haven't worked that out. Um, <laughs> and um, if that's part of your, if that's part of your faith, though. I'm very comfortable with people having an unofficial intercommunion and, uh, and welcome you to make up your mind and welcome you to be here and prayerfully join in the spirit of the prayer and sharing. If I say any more, we'll get a major, you'll get a credit for theology. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I hope you're not, this isn't on the tape, is it? We're not taping yet, are we? Uh, let's pray the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I'd like to share a bit about the notion of surrender. The third step made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God as we understand Him. Um, this is the heart of uh, the spiritual life and recovery, and it's uh, and I always scratch around for a way to start out because it's so interesting. There's so many angles on this thing, um, and what occurred to me today is the you know the the big re- it's a revolutionary step, uh, totally. And when I first hear surrender, believe me, I sure don't. When I first read the third step and gave it some thought, uh, I sure didn't get it straight by what they meant. And I'm somebody with upper division credits. <laughs> and surrender. I studied surrender professionally before I uh, drank. There's a um, department of theology called aesthetical theology. And it has to do with the principles of becoming a saint. How to, principles of sanctity. And, uh, t- surrender and giving oneself over to higher power and living in that relationship totally in a receiving way. Anything you say? Higher power? Any suggestions? I'm ready for the will of God to be the, the main thing. That's the heart of it. And, um, and I just didn't get it. When I'd read the surrender step, it seemed to me that what they were doing was trying to make it palatable. The bad news palatable. You know, trying to say, well, you must surrender. But what they meant was, the fun is over. Uh, that time to start getting serious. And keeping all the resolutions you could never keep. <laughs> Doing it right. Shape up. No more messing around. Um, and yes, we say surrender, make it sound nice. 
that was the impression I'd receive after my graduate course. Because I, I had my eye, it was affected by fear in a way I did not understand, and I had my eye on results. Results, results, results. And this surrender that we're invited, what our higher power does here is invites us into taking the third step and says, I, in effect, if I might paraphrase what I think my higher power is saying to me, he's saying, I got good news for you. I'm going to let you off the hook. You've been torturing yourself. You got yourself in a double bind, a no-win proposition, day in and day out. You've assigned yourself the task of becoming happy and fulfilled by getting your own way a lot. <laughs> and you can't get your own way enough to be happy and fulfilled if that's the standard of happiness and fulfillment, that's getting your own way a lot. You just get frustrated too much. You can't get them to cooperate. You can't get your own insides to cooperate enough. you got enough hang-ups and defects of character, and they won't, they're not too anxious to, to get into your program and to cooperate with you. And so you've got yourself a possible assignment. Learn how to drink right. Learn how to drink with, and I'm going to let you off the hook and show you a way to live with some inner peace and harmony, with maximum harmony with your fellows, your brothers and sisters, uh, where you don't have to condemn yourself to this kind of frustration. Is that good news? Yeah. That's what I consider surrender to be. We're invited into this. He says, come forward, and you say, turn your life and your will over to the care of God. And that sounds so religious, so spiritual. Uh, beyond uh, what it's uh, you do that you're pretty sure it'll jeopardize your financial and sex life a lot <laughs> you know that you <laughs> you know from what you know of God he has not been interested in in seeing you get more money or sex and um and that probably won't be part of the program um, uh, and so we, again, the results thing. You know. Now, uh, but we still are drawn forward because that's the that's the logical place to be. Do we hit bottom and realize that we are being helped out? Realize we're being helped enough to start having a faith and a power greater than ourselves. And this um, surrender, uh, and again, back to the we. See, we look at everything and out of the window that we're accustomed to looking out of. From the window I'm most, have done most of my looking from is the window of fear. The window where I'm threatened, I'm, I'm just pretty anxious that people think well of me to reassure me I'm all right, and I'm anxious that, um, uh, you know, that I get a good rating, uh, so that at least I'm above average, you know, in most respects. Um, I'm anxious that I not be bereft and left alone, and I get my turn, <coughs> and I have a little fun, and of course be spiritual, and, um, generous and rich. Um, uh, pretty important to have these things, and have, um, relationship that fulfills me, uh, relationship. And uh, the uh, our higher power is saying, look, I, I have to ask you to simply realize that as you look out of that window, you will remain frustrated forever. I want you to look out of a different window. Uh, look out of the window where you're invited not to be the center of the universe, embattled, uh, worried about critics um, and those against you and those frustrating you. But to look out of the window where you are one of God's children. You are loved by your higher power. You're one of God's children. And you're not the center of the universe. And that's going to let you off the hook. See, while I'm the center of the universe, everybody's my adversary. Because you're the only way you can be good unto me is by cooperating with my version of being the center. And uh, when I'm not the center, but when I'm on the 
when I'm kind of holding hands, just the way I do after a meeting, and forming a circle around a higher power, and I'm one of the folks, I realize that uh, I don't have to have things, quote, turn out uh, all the time. And that's the, the break, the breaking in of this new thing. Um, I can't emphasize too much that it's always transformation. It's, it's doing it in a radically different way. That's what surrender invites us to do. Uh, now, the minute we get into a bit of surrender, um, it, let me describe surrender on the, on the three levels first. Um, surrender is a, is affirming our relationship to a higher power. Saying, God, you're God, and I'm not. Um, I'm one of the folks. Um, and I'm, uh, and I want to learn to live in, you know, what do you do to live? See, that's the surrender question. The non-surrender question is, how do I get it? How do I get the result I know I've got to have? How do I get, how do I lose weight, stop drinking, get more money, have a better relationship, and get it all nailed down? How do I get that? And it is, we'll just have to ask you to stop asking that. We'll have to ask you to stop and ask a different. We'd like you to ask, what do I do next to live in harmony as a child of God? What do I do to make it around here? Aha! Now, now there's something possible, see? Because we can't achieve the results. They say, well, one of the things you do is uh, show up at meetings <laughs> and uh, be open for identification. And uh, when you find yourself identifying with somebody, we'd like you to know that that doesn't threaten your life and that's all right. When you identify with other alcoholics and say, oh my God, I'm more of an alcoholic than I thought. Um, but that's don't worry about that. That's good. Yeah. You identify more. And let's say you uh, find yourself not worried about results, but you're... Uh, again, we get free demonstrations. Our higher power kind of draws us into surrender on many levels. And then he asks us to affirm, to find our name to it later. Yeah. I found that my basic surrender... I stumbled into. I think maybe most people do, but I stumbled into the first, to the beginning of real surrender. I'd been hospitalized five times in an aversion treatment hospital, once in a psychiatric division of a major hospital, and then shipped to New Jersey. Um, they weren't waiting with bated breath in Los Angeles to see how I'd do. Um, after multiple hospitalizations, they're not waiting anymore to find out. We're written off, kind of healthy in a way. Um, written off in that sense of ever turning out the way I wanted to turn out fine. Okay, I'm, I'm back in New Jersey. And the deal was, uh, you had to go to four meetings a week and they wouldn't feed you. It's okay, go. It's okay, I'll do that. Some more. And as I went to meetings, and begin to be drawn into the fellowship and into the program. Um, I was doing stuff that has to do with surrender. Now I didn't even know. Somehow our higher power takes away from us the burden of clutching onto results the way we have been accustomed to. You know, we were trying to drink right and get away with it for years, and then we finally just. <clears throat> We stop clutching it because we're just tired of it. We just, or I'm clutching, I want to make this marriage work. I want to make these kids behave. And if I just do this and I do this, and finally you just... <laughs> we, the results, we don't clutch the results because it's so evident that we're not going to get the results that we just kind of... Okay, that combined with 
simply taking a hand. Remember the, the surrender thing is obsession with results transformed into an agreement to live with uh, a relationship where we do footwork. I do footwork instead of obsessed with results. And so another way of imitating the image is that I'm up, I'm in the center of the universe working it out by myself the best I can to be and then so much pain and frustration that I get demoralized and stop doing it. And then someone reaches out a hand. The program reaches out a hand and says, Will you take my hand? I'd like you to walk this way and wake up. I say, Well I'm not so sure if I what is this out anyway? We're gonna do Will you take my hand? Just give a, come with me a few steps. Just, you just gotta take a chance for a few steps. If we, if I wait until you understand this, we are gonna wait forever. <laughs> In fact, there's no way to understand it without being a good sport and trying it out a little bit. Oh, well, since there's absolutely nothing else going on in my life, um, and there's, Nothing else holds any promise, whatever. Uh, we kind of take the hand and walk along with it. So I'm walking along, holding somebody's hand, instead of working things out in private. This is a revolution. This is a totally different approach to life. I'm walking along, holding a hand. And as I'm doing that, I'm being drawn into some mutuality, into uh, a mutual sharing of stuff on a level at a deep enough level where it's shocking. People are saying these awful things about themselves. It's very embarrassing. They say this stuff out in public. Um, and then we're asked to uh, agree to be a part of the group, and we find we are anyway, whether we agree or not. Um, we find ourselves beginning to live like an alcoholic, live like an alanon, live according to the truth of our gut, of our inside. And we're, it's kind of like a fiat accompli. It's done. We're into it. And that's, that's what I found. I was just, I was going to meetings every single day, twice on Saturday. Um, and I was hanging out with alcoholics, and I was feeling this deep thing. Of course I'm alcoholic. And I felt peaceful about being alcoholic. And so I was in a relationship, a new kind of relationship with a higher power, and starting to surrender, agree, to simply live as a child of God and do this footwork. Now, as I was kind of tricked into doing it, just like as I just said to it, I said, okay, I can't think of anything else right now. And as it began to take a little bit, and I began to surrender, there's a remarkable thing about surrender. On the one hand, it seems very unnatural to do it. And on the other hand, the minute we do it, it seems very natural. It seems well, of course. Of course I'm an alcoholic. I mean, any dummy can see that. Um, and we got relaxed with it. Huh? Um, of course, sharing on a level of uh, emotional honesty, where you listen to other people take their turn and I take my turn, of course that's a, uh, that's a humane, human, sensible sort of a way to live it. I'm a human being. I'm a social animal. I need to have other people share their guts so I can identify and get reaffirmation that I'm... A, of course, once you're doing it, it's sure... Why, of course, it's natural as it can be. Uh, any of us want to do that when we're drinking? Go to a meeting and wait 50 minutes for your turn? I mean, that's just absurd. Uh, that's why when a person is under the influence, they don't do well in a whole meeting, you know, you see. Um, but, the, but this levels of surrender, um, I want to distinguish three levels. The full surrender, all out, the nausea level, and the not yet ready level. And the full level is full of paradox, because the minute I fully surrender and just let go and I'm not, I find myself not fighting anything half because I lost the energy to fight 
And the other half is I begin to identify with people who are not fighting, and they gave me permission. You're not being unpatriotic when you don't fight yourself. And so the combination of the two things, I actually relax for a few minutes. And I relax, and I'm in harmony, and I'm not fighting who I am and what I am. And I find out, oh, this is nice. Surrender, once we're doing it, is invisible. Once we're doing it, you don't feel especially religious or spiritual. You just feel sane. You just feel like you've stopped doing some real dumb things. You just feel like you're not giving yourself an arbitrary, stupid, bad time. Full surrender is the simplest kind of respect for reality, the way it is. It's agreeing to live in the world as it is. But if you don't agree to live in the world as it is, the world stays exactly the same anyway. And the only difference is that I have a tightened gut and I'm in, in conflict and turmoil. And when I agree to live in the world as it is, anything else other than that seems so stupid that I wonder why I ever did it. It takes, take the issue of surrendering in a relationship. It doesn't mean letting the other person use you as a doormat. It means being willing to let that other person be who and what they are fully, unconditionally, without any reservation. You give them permission to be the big jerk they are. <laughs> or you give them permission to be the beautiful person they are. And it's the same thing. You know, if you can't see they're a beautiful person, then you can't see them. If you know that they're a jerk who's a beautiful person, you have a chance. You can... Uh, just give them permission to have all the hang-ups and all the... Give them permission to be somebody who can't listen, to be somebody who can't catch on to the easiest thing in the world. Um, and um, once we've done that, we notice at least two things. And we can't do that by ourselves, only with God's help. Only in the program, surrounded by the cloud of witnesses, surrounded by a lot of support, can we let another person truly be. And as soon as you let another person be, even if it's for like 10 minutes, there's two things. One is, you will, the goodness and beauty God put in that person becomes available to you. They're cute. They got, there's, a, there's a certain, uh, the beauty and the interest they have is now available because we're not fighting them. And the other is that they don't get on your nerves the same way at all. They just don't drive you nuts. They be, instead of being a jerk who drives you nuts, they become a character. Now, it just about kills you to do this, of course. And you know, we only do it with God's help. But the minute we do it, it is it's, the, it's like the air here today. It's the sunshine and clear air blowing by. You say, well, what else would I do? Like not let them be who they are? When you're letting somebody be who they are, it's so manifestly obvious that that's the only sane thing to do that it's impossible to imagine not doing it. <laughs> Until we have some pressure that makes us take it back in five minutes later. Um, it does... We, right before we let somebody, we release somebody, it seems like if we do that, they'll go right down the tube without our support of holding them in place. Uh, they'll just fall apart. If I'm not insisting, they don't. Um, and of course, they, and, um, surrendering somebody improves them a lot. Um, they have this big overhaul right before your eyes. Now, when we're surrendering, the deep surrender we experience not as a great feat that we deserve some applause for or credit for. We experience deep surrender for what it really is. A blessing from God. Simple sanity. Nothing more than simple sanity. It's just what anybody would do if they couldn't keep any secrets and all the lights were on. The, uh, all the, the emotional, mental lights were on. Now, The nausea level. The nausea level is that level of surrender where we, you're talking to your sponsor and you're explaining a few reasons why you're miserable. And, uh, 
because of the person you're living with. Who's, uh, uh, it's so uh, unreasonable and hostile and full of deceit. Um, and, you, <laughs> and your sponsor says, well, you know, uh, you didn't just find this out. Uh, you're, um, and you've been living there a long time, but, uh, do you think your own attitude may have some play here? Uh, that you're, uh, that you're kind of sitting there, hanging on, you've decided that they don't have any more excuse for certain behavior, because they should know enough by now, and you're hanging on to this thing, saying, they, ha they should change, they should change, and they won't, and it's just outrageous, and it's unjust. Um, and I refuse to be relaxed or happy until they change. Um, in the, uh, do you think that maybe your own insistence that they be different might be the biggest single factor in your anguish right now? That somebody who is sick and who is on, is kind of not too loving, they're difficult to be around. Um, but when we add our own lack of surrender in our own funny ways, it just redoubles and triples and quadruples the anguish that results from being around a person like that. And they, and the responses suggest that maybe when you let that person go entirely, that it won't make life just perfect, but it will take away probably three quarters of all the anguish you have. And the, and if, if you begin to believe just a little bit of that, you get sick to your stomach immediately. <laughs> you get, you, there's a nausea, you know, this thing of, <laughs> that somehow, the little flashes of fear come in that it's like your fault and they're going to make fun of you. And then you're going to have to let something be, and you're afraid if you let those muscles relax, that, uh, that you just might disappear or fall apart or you won't know who you are or, um, that makes you sick to your stomach, sick of fear and, and self-loathing and, and embarrassment and, uh, oh God. And they, and you could have done this years ago. You could just do this by yourself. You don't need the other person's cooperation. You've been waiting for them to do something for years and now you're finding out that you can do something without waiting for them that's the key deal, you know. It is so embarrassing that you're sick to your stomach. Um, and the, and then as soon as you make the move and start letting go, the nausea passes. We even feel disloyal at that point. Especially with kids. If you surrender your children, well you just feel like you're an irresponsible parent. If you don't insist that they be, turn out right. Um, and of course, when we retire from being God, don't play God, and let God be God in ourselves, you know, your obligation is to, if you do have children, is to be a mother and not God. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, as we, as we begin to make the move, the nausea does begin to pass. It's, um, we start getting over it, and then it, when we're in the surrender, again, it's like clear air. And it's as if, well, of course I do this. Why would I do anything different? Once we're in surrender, it just seems impossible not to do it. Um, then there's a not ready yet level. And that has to do with the, those issues in our life where we're bedeviled still by some behavior or some feeling that, uh, we, or we have conflicts about them. They bother us. Uh, we can't decide whether it's so bad or wrong, but it bothers us. Um, anybody have any obsessive habits that, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, anyone uh, have a problem with procrastination? No. This kind of goes, I touched on this last night with uh, the thing of you know, accepting ourselves as procrastinators, you know, who would do one thing in front of us, uh, adulterers who 
commit adultery or don't commit adultery today and give thanks if you don't have to be in anguish. Um, but the, let's say procrastination. Procrastination is deferring things. I think the root of it is fear, sort of a perfectionism, that I don't want to do it until I'm pretty sure I'll do it well enough not to be humiliated and made fun of. And that while I'm considering how to do it right, four more things come in to do. And uh, which now makes me have five things to do. It's much more difficult to do five things in one and to do it well enough for my own standards. And so this is a bigger problem, so I must contemplate more deeply um, how to do five. And there are... By the time I start making the first move, there are nine more things. And then mail came, and I'm in despair. Um, and so they, we want to get over this, you know. And so you're going to struggle around with it and pray and turn it over and so forth. And still there's a certain pattern in your life uh, of procrastination and the the kind of anguish and uh, pressure that goes along with that. And and so you've worked surrender. You've done the surrender prayer. You've done this and that. And, and you're still opening your mail by opening this. Well, I'm going to have to do something about that. Now, what's the next thing? Advertisement. Well, I know I probably don't want it, but I wonder who I read a little bit about it. And I might want this later. I don't know. And uh, then there's a little bill here. Uh, well, I'll have to pay it today. I, um, and so you've opened up all the mail and haven't made one decision. Uh, uh, and the anyway, I don't want to go on too long. But the point is. How does surrender come in this thing? If you're in the middle of something, an obsessive compulsive habit of uh, eating chocolate at night or having multiple affairs or uh, are not making decisions when you open up the mail. Um, and it sort of bugs you. It's on your mind a lot about the mess in your, in your desk or your kitchen. Um, and um, so does surrender have anything? Now, you might think, well, yeah. It says, turn, turn it over to God and do your footwork and get it done and you'll be all right. Right. Uh, what about when you turn it over to God and you keep behaving the same way? And then you say, well, that's just a little... I don't know, this doesn't work with surrender. I'll just put this over in another compartment and go on. Uh, uh. And we have tried to surrender it, and we've got it in the surrender prayer, and we've done some things like that. And it still hasn't changed very much. Then there's some resistance in holding on to something that's down deep enough below the surface, but we don't have access. We Now... So the surrender question is, are you willing to be a person with an obsessive compulsive habit that you don't have access to the roots of, you don't understand? Are you willing to be that? Are you willing to get up today and live your life with a willingness to be enlightened, but knowing you're not enlightened yet, and you're hanging on to some old ideas and fear in regard to this thing? Are you willing to show up and know that you're not making much progress on this but you're willing to be it. You're willing to be a person with a sex problem, with a fear problem, with a money problem, with a stealing from the store problem. Uh, you're willing to be that. You can't fake it. You've got to be really willing to have a problem you can't solve in your terms right away. But you're willing to keep on the table and not make a complete secret of. Tell somebody about and to be willing to do some footwork and willing to have the footwork not pay off in the terms you'd like it to pay off, which is make it go away. Or make the guilt go away so I can enjoy myself more. Um, or something. You know, to, uh, <laughs> to get the uh, tension down so I feel better. Results. And the surrender says, no, you don't get to pick your results. We want you to show up before your higher power with your real life as it is, turn yourself in, and be willing to do footwork, and trust God 
to show us love and care for you while you are unfinished, while you are voluntarily or involuntarily hanging on to some thing where you don't even understand yourself. That's the not ready yet surrender. And you say, well, Father, are you just kind of making an elaborate rationalization so we can keep, so you can keep doing or we can keep doing whatever the hell you want to do? I hope not. I think we can misuse anything. But I taught, I know myself and I've talked to many, many, many people. And I see people, you know, kicking themselves around and, you know, kind of endorsing surrender, but just figuring, well, it doesn't work for me and I can't do that. And I just, um, I see a lack of a willingness to live in the presence of God with an unsolved problem. And to work our surrender means to be willing to live with an unsolved problem. You know? And not insist we get it all together every in two minutes. Or in two years. Or in ten years. Uh, and to keep showing up at the place where it works, you know. Uh, to be willing to... Anyway. Um, back to that notion of results. Uh... I find that I have to uh, think about this in an explicit way to work any kind of surrender in my life all the time. Uh, this is something that, you know, we say a surrender prayer, and I like to end the session with a surrender, surrender prayer, or the transition to a meeting. Um, but that surrender prayer gets us to have surrender as our life policy. But the fifth So it's real. You say the surrender prayer and mean it with God's help. It changes the way you live and the way you are. But it doesn't get your our whole selves into surrender every minute. It's obvious because we have a lot of conflict still. Uh, That's our life policy. So it bothers us more when we don't surrender, after we surrender, than it did before we surrendered. Because we didn't know what surrender was. Um, But every time we do anything, Every time we do anything, all the way from saying, good morning, that's doing something, up to starting a law course, uh, up to uh, starting a new career, up to starting a new relationship, every time we embark on the simplest little thing or the most demanding long-term thing, we have a result in mind, and it's not bad to have a result in mind. It's absolutely inevitable to have a result in mind because we wouldn't get geared up to do anything unless we had a result in mind. And it's fine. It's just that as we stare every time we start anything and there's a result in mind, as we do it, we have the habit of saying, higher power, you know what I want. I know what I want. I'd like this to work. Thy will be done and I'm willing for it not to. To give the result away if we think of it that explicitly. And if we, sometimes we can get into a habit of doing it rather easily, um, and that just brings all kinds of peace, all kinds of maturity into our life. Uh, But we still have the result. We hope it works, and we'll we'll shift a little bit and hope it comes close, you know. And if it doesn't, then we reorganize and and do something different and do it over again. Um, Take it to be very simple, like, as soon as we turn over that result, then we're, we have some security and we don't go crazy. We're not vulnerable to other people's behavior so much. If I say good morning, I have a result in mind. I'd like you to look back at me and say good morning back. Uh, now, if I surrender the result and be, and I, I'm fundamentally willing for you not to say good morning back, it'll still kind of hurt my feelings if you don't. But it's, it'll hurt my feelings, but if I'm surrendered, after my feelings are hurt, my reaction to her will be, I wonder what's wrong with her. She must be kind of distracted or out of it today to not notice. I'll say a prayer for her. If I've not surrendered, I'll say, you're not going to catch me saying good morning to you, you. Um, <laughs> you know, you took something away from me. I gave. You didn't. You know. Da, da, da. 
I'll have hostility and I'll be upset. It's all a matter of that, that totally different approaches, you know. And as we start out in a relationship, if we want this relationship to work, it's fine. That's human. Everybody wants a relationship to work and be nice and turn out. If we insist that it turns out, it's like walking up to somebody and putting your hand on their elbow and squeezing and saying, Honey, it's up to you now to make me happy. And I'm not letting go until you do. (laughs) Or if we are willing, if we grant the other person total freedom and so forth, it kills you too, you know. If you want it to work so much, but we are willing, God, please let me have the willingness to let this person do whatever they're going to do and be whoever they want to be and let them go. Uh, and then, hello. <laughs> a little conversation. And then we can, uh, we're much better met. We don't scare people nearly as much when we've surrendered them. The same way you notice yourself, when you meet somebody who has not assigned you the role of making them happy, you can breathe easy. And as soon as you detect any assignment, um, that it's up to you now to make them happy, uh, it's hard going and you're not living in the world of surrender. Uh, so it's a, it's just a blessing. We, we often think of surrender in terms of doing something that's difficult and that's a big deal. And boy, oh, I'm going to surrender and turn it over and give it away and let God's way be first and mine second and, and like we're really giving up a lot, you know? We're giving up grief. <laughs> and insanity and a grinding gut. Uh, see, it's really heroic, isn't it? Uh, yeah. uh, but so often, it's it's impossible to do by ourselves. I think one of the 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 aspect of surrender that I find you know, very maybe the worst, hardest myself, and I think it's very much human nature is to uh, is to agree to have all of your hang-ups and not push them let your your fears and your phobias and your hang-ups and everything be just as they are and ask God to help you do the next thing that's sensible for a person in your shape and trust God to love you and show care for you while you're in the shape you're in. Uh, that, uh, to me, is the most difficult thing in the world. There's a feeling that, first, I gotta get over this and that, and then I'll be positioned well for, for, for moving ahead. But I'm not positioned well. Enough. Wait a minute, God. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let's take this. Uh, my sponsor said that the, that the unforgivable sin is to avoid God until you're in good enough shape to fool him. Uh, yeah. Just somehow you know, not bring it up to God until you're in better shape. You know? And uh, a lot of times, you know, with the awareness, the ACA thing, you know, we become aware of um, of how we get our reaction to a sick family has has resulted in our being wired in a way, you know, kind of uh, the readiness to do real stupid things. To kind of get very attracted to sick people, uh, to, to go into, uh, deep feelings of anxiety and guilt when other people are having problems, you know? Take emotional responsibility for other people's problems and lie low. And we think, I gotta get over that! And surrender says, let's walk along the path of healing in the program. Let's be willing to have your history and your wiring and the way you are and trust God as you do the steps to take care of you with your wiring. It's not tragic. You're going to do all right. You don't have to wait until you're over something before you're allowed, before you're allowed to breathe and live. Um, you do footwork, but we do it in a calm spirit. We do it in a step by step way. Um, I'm a little late, but you were a little late too. Um, the, uh, so let's pray the surrender prayer together now. Um, and then I'd like you to be patient. 
Wait a minute. Let and and, and count off again, okay? And we'll do the. What do we do first? Um, let's pray the prayer first, and then be good sport and stay where you can be counted for about one minute. Now let's uh, get myself. Some of you know this by heart, and some of you don't. If you don't know it by heart, just say Amen at the end. God, I offer myself to Thee to build with me and to do with me as Thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do Thy will. Take away my difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of Thy power, Thy love, and Thy way of life. May I do Thy will always. Okay, eight. This is the end of session three, the start of session four. There's a six word, three sentence summary of the program that you're all familiar with, I'm sure. Trust God, clean house, help others. And the, the middle part of that, clean house, is what I'd like to reflect on here. The middle steps of the program, taking inventory. Uh, Sharing the inventory, the humility steps of six and seven, where we agree to let God work on us uh, and beg Him to, <laughs> and the amen step. These um, these steps are kind of under the heading cleaning house, telling the truth, and I um, that I, I use the word clean house, the phrase. Because it gives me the creeps so much. I just hear clean house, and there's a chill up my spine, and um, oh God, clean house. Uh, Got to confess and get my sins straight, and you know what that means. Once you confess them, there's got to be a firm purpose of amendment. This is Catholic language, um, and that means you can't do them again. And there's there's two two pos there's two results of not being able to do your sins again. One is that you really will not do them again and never have any fun for the rest of your life. <laughs> or you will do them again and feel like a failure and guilty and so forth. So it, if you're reflecting on this whole issue in a spirit of fear, it's very discouraging. And of course, that's, I've been talking about transformation. Transformation of attitude, transformation of spirit, transformation of the way we live, that it isn't a matter of uh, finally getting enough strength to do what we always needed and had to be done. It's a matter of being led by our higher power to do it in another way. And I think this issue of telling the truth is the is right at the Maybe the, like the, the most stark uh, instance of something changing in the middle. You know, the very nature of it changes as we come towards the program. You know, the fourth step comes after the first three, and the uh, first three, without the first three steps, it really would be stupid to take an inventory, because all we would do is take it in our in our old attitude. We just write out a bunch of things we feel guilty about. And feel bad, and feel worse. Um, an inventory is only safe and only makes sense when we've taken the first three steps, or in the middle of them. You know, when we when we're drawn into them and and have that spirit. The um, you know, and think of it this way: we, we're trend, we're transformed from fear to faith. We're not transformed from being fearful people into being people full of faith with no fear anymore. A basic principle is that we never get over anything. We never get rid of anything entirely. Well, you can say you get rid of drinking entirely if you stay sober a day at a time. But we don't get rid of alcoholism at all. We don't get rid of our being fearful in many ways. What we do is add the program. We add the experience of being accepted with respect and love and uh, 
we add this faith thing. And as we add that, we get to live more and more in the spirit of faith while our fears are around. The more faith we have, the more program we have, the more the fears get scrunched up to the side and don't have much of an effect. They'll rush right back to center stage the minute they have room to move in. Um, but there, there they are. Now, the experience we have, and I, I think all of us share this right here. Uh, you know, we lived a life where, where you lied. I lied a lot. I lied in a very systematic, never let up way when I drank. I didn't think of myself as lying very much. I thought I was a pretty good guy. I didn't even think I was lying unless I told a big fat lie. You know, the big fat one where you just lie. You know? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> tell them something different. But if it's anything short of that, um, I didn't count it as, you know, it's like exercising your right to privacy kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but to give some notion of, of how consistent uh, my lying was, I kind of did a little role playing in my imagination of what it would have been like had I ever told the truth while drinking. Now, I never did, but if I ever had told the truth while I was drinking, it would have gone something like this. I would have gone over, let's say you invited me over to the house for Saturday night social get-together, and I knew you well enough to know there'd be booze there. And if I was assured there'd be booze there and I didn't have a better offer, I'd say, sure, I'll be over. And, uh, and if I were going to tell the truth, which I never did, I would have arrived at your house, knocked on the door, you'd answer the door and say, hi, thanks for asking me over. Um, I'd like to lay my cards on the table and get a few things straight before we start out this evening. Um, I'm here to drink. Uh, and, uh, I'd like a double scotch right now. Before we go on anymore, with any talk. Now. Okay. So I get my drink, I say, look, you were nice enough to ask me over. I'm going to be a good sport. You got games to play? I'll play the games. Other people coming over? I'll mix it up. You know, trying to get a Usually this kind of an evening, I get a little bit gassed, but I do all right generally. However, it's only fair to warn you, sometimes I go crazy. And uh, I might throw up on the rug, get in a fight, try to seduce somebody. But that's the chance you take when you ask me over. Uh, and, uh, uh, you didn't tell the truth either, did you? Uh, see, when I'm living as an alcohol, drinking alcoholic, or with the whole attitude, the whole fear way of life, it is to my interest that you not know a lot about what I'm up to and what I feel and what's going on, because it interferes with the whole project if you know too much, um, if you know hardly anything. Uh, I never tell. And that's a way of life. And the whole people-pleasing thing, the whole screening off that I try to control your reactions by just feeding you the stuff I want you to hear, uh, that's just so deadening, you know. Just boring, Dullsville. Uh, life when we just tell each other the good stuff. You know, what we're waiting for is the real good stuff. Um, you know, with some honesty about what's happening. The, um, so we come, we, and we're accustomed to this. You know, we live for years with this practice thing of hiding our weaknesses, hiding what could be embarrassing, hiding anything that could be used by the enemy uh, to make it harder to get a drink or make it harder uh, or, or, or find us being despised. Um, that fear. Um, we come, you know, okay, fast forward into <laughs> crashing and burning and the frustration of being a co in a family with just being obsessed with uh, trying to help out and try to change things. Um, and, and it just is severe for someone who is uh, in the family disease is not drinking, 
because almost all of the all of the the energy in trying to change the behavior of somebody else when the focus is on changing behavior good tactics always dictate that you parcel out the information very judiciously you don't let them know certain things you let them know other things it's always manipulative when we have our focus on the behavior change and you never let them know what you're really up to it's always some kind of a little angle uh, and it gets them mad all the time and there's reactive stuff the and so we come to the program with years of habit of this and as you come in the program come in a meeting you hear people actually volunteering things that put them at a disadvantage in your where you usually live you know I remember going to my 12 step house in New Jersey and there was a skinny priest named Father Mike uh, Mad Mike we called him and he uh, we just been to a meeting I've been to about one or two meetings and he said boy I have ever do I have a resentment against that secretary of the Wednesday night uh, Morris Plains meeting I can't he I can't stand him but well I'll Oh, I gotta turn it over. I'll turn him over and say a prayer. I had never heard an adult talk like that in my life. I had never heard a grown up person acknowledge that they did something wrong and say they were gonna try to correct it with God's help. I'd never heard, I heard confessions, but I never heard anybody just say it in conversation. Priest or non priest or man or woman. I, it was shocked. And I heard, and, I, and then of course the reaction to him was, oh yeah, Mike, he's, he's, you know, he's a tough guy to get along with. There was acceptance. You know. And then you hear more and more of this stuff. And so it, all the rules are changed. See, it's turned upside down. From being, having to hide stuff so that we won't be rejected and criticized and given a bad time and make it harder to get a drink. We get into this thing where, uh, the weight of our own secrets and the heaviness of all of this um, uh, isolation and uh, we're just not connecting, you know. We're, we're not identifying enough to, to have any solace given to our hearts, and we're we're alone, and there's no there's no real comfort because it's uh, we don't get comfort by somebody saying, "Oh, poor thing, poor baby." It doesn't give comfort. <laughs> what gives comfort is someone else to tell you what they've done, and then when you say what how you feel. And what you've done, they'll say, yeah, I know what you mean. That, that you get comfort then, you know. Uh, and so we start getting this thing where we say what's in our heart, and instead of anybody using that to their advantage, they receive it matter-of-factly, and we identify. And when that happens, the tra- that's a transformation right there, you know, on the spot. But then, when it happens, there's further transformation. There's a transformation down deeper that we, because we identify and connect up with somebody and we don't feel alone anymore, well, then it, we don't feel so bad. And we know we're, this is part of being a human being. And we don't, maybe we don't get over what we've just discussed and don't solve the problem on the spot. Um, I know as a, in my own background, I would hesitate to say things because I thought if I, once I said it, I had to have a way to solve it. Completely. And I'd be skeptical about being able to solve it. Never have another drink again. You know, never have a dirty thought again. <laughs> never have... Um, Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.